Hey guys, welcome to our AP Psychology Midterm Review. It means we are more than halfway through our content, which is so exciting. Um, so we're going to get ready for our big test coming up, and then we are going to crush it, then move forward and start new content again, which is so exciting. So let's get started. So first things first, we're going to talk about major people, and the first one is John D. Watson. Now he's a behaviorist. His major experiment is the Little Albert Experiment. He's going to use classical conditioning to prove that fear is conditioned, and can be generalized or spread um, to other stimuluses that are not the original. Like for instance, in the experiment, which we'll get into a little bit more, he's gonna. We're gonna see that a white rat is then going to be generalized to a white rabbit, to a white fur coat, and further from there. Now our next major person is B.F. Skinner, who's also a behaviorist. He created operant conditioning and did work in the Skinner boxes. He demonstrated that rewards and punishments shape behavior and created reinforcement schedules, which you guys loved because of the bells. So he is a huge deal and a huge foundation of psychology. Um, our next major gentleman is Albert Bandora. He's a behaviorist. He created and founded observational learning, and his famous experiment was Bobo dolls. He proved that we mimic what we see. So the idea of, oh, violent movies and stuff that doesn't affect youth, well, now you know it does affect youth. Obviously, of different ages have different effects. Our next uh, psychologist is going to be Howard Gardner. He's a cognitive psychologist. He came up with Gardner's multiple intelligences, and he believed my, uh, intelligence takes many forms and varies in depth, as why he started with nine intelligences and eventually will grow to 11, but all he needs nine for us. And finally, uh, one of our next big guys is um, Hermann Abangus. Now, he's also a cognitive psychologist. He does study the intelligence. He does the forgetting curve. He's going to prove intelligence and memory mimic each other and the ability to be retained. And the curve quickly demonstrates a quick loss immediately after learning, but some content is going to be retained. But he's a cognitive psychologist. And my favorite is Ivan Pavlov. Look how friendly he is. <laughs> Uh, he is a behaviorist. He's famous for his Pavlov dogs experiments, and he's obviously the founder of classical conditioning. He proved that a conditioned stimulus can elicit a response after conditioning. So, now that we've gone through all the big players, let's talk about the big experiments. So we just talked about all the major people. Let's talk about the experiments in which they did. Now, one of the big experiments you need to know for your exam is the visual cliff. It was done by Gibson. Babies are put onto a glass table with a pattern on it to show depth changes from one side to another. The mom's going to stand on one side and try to get the baby to climb on the glass. Obviously, no babies were hurt here. Climb over the gla glass to the mom and see if the babies could tell if there was a danger or not. And 90% of the babies did not crawl over the glass to go see the mom. So what does that teach us? Since babies wouldn't go where it dropped off, it shows that depth perception is innate, which means it's uh, biological preparedness, which means we have it inside of ourselves to keep ourselves safe. Now, another major experiment is the Little Albert experiment with John B. Watson. Um, what happened is in his experiment, he introduced baby Albert to rats and rabbits with and monkeys, of course, he was my favorite, with no fear. Then Watson, Watson scared the rat uh, scared the baby with the rat in his lap and conditioned Albert to fear rats. Now once he did that, he, Albert himself generalized because it was a white rat. Then he showed him a white uh, rabbit and then a white uh, for a coat and it teaches us that fear is classical conditioning as well as generalization which is when he started fearing the rat when he only conditioned him to fear uh, fearing the rabbit when he only conditioned him to fear the rat. Now Skinner boxes are also another major experimental piece. These are done by B.F. Skinner. Now these experimental boxes or Skinner boxes are devices that allow positive reinforcement to be given to the subject on whatever reinforcement schedule being used. So it shows us that operant conditioning and reinforcement can shape behavior. Uh, remember, when you think of Skinner boxes, think of pushing on the, a bell or a lever in order to get a treat. Um, it's an enclosed situation in order to keep the animal trapped. Now your next major experiment is the Bobo doll experiment done by Albert Bandor. Children are in a room and they watch a video of an adult beating up a Bobo doll. 
once the kids finish watching the adult beat the doll, they are introduced, walked into a playroom that has tons of other toys. And in the corner of the room is a Bobo doll. Uh, 90 or 85% of all kids go straight to the Bobo doll and mimic the adult by beating it up. Uh, it teaches us that we mimic what we see, uh, especially children. Now, Abangus, he did the forgetting curve, and he memorized nonsense syllables. How to remember that? Abangus has a lot of syllables in it, nonsense syllables, memorizing. And he teaches us, it, this experiment teaches us that immediately after learning something, we forget a large amount of it. Um, however, some of it is retained, as you can see. If you look on the chart, uh, you're going to see immediate recall is 100%. But then 19 minutes, it goes down to 60. About four, uh, 63 minutes, it's already down. One day, and it just goes, flats off. However, about 20% is retained after 31 days, which honestly is a little higher than I expected. Uh, Pavlov's dogs, which is the most exper important experiment, especially for learning. It's done by Evan Pavlov. He used classical conditioning to train dogs to elicit a response to a bell that before conditioning only responded with salvation to food. Okay, so now this is a huge part. Please make sure you are familiar with UCS, UCR, CS, CR, and all that stuff. So what happens is uh, Ivan Pavlov introduces, uh, gives a dog food as you would if you gave your dog food right now, they would start drooling. So the food with no conditioning is the unconditioned stimulus or UCS. The dog immediately with no training, with no conditioning, is going to start salivating. That's going to be the unconditioned response. Now, we're going to introduce a bell to the dog, and the dog is going to have no response. He's just going to look at you and say, what the hell are you doing? Now, during conditioning, what we're going to do is we're going to ring the bell and prevent the, uh, present the food at the same time. Now, because we're presenting food and ringing the bell at the same time during conditioning, salvation is going to occur. So, we're do presenting food, which is going to make the dog salivate, but we're also adding the ringing of the bell. After many times of doing that, eventually the bell, which is now the condition stimulus, is going to trigger salvation without any food or a conditioned response. Make sure you know and understand that. If you have any questions, please let me know. But So what happens is the bell is eventually going to be the condition stimulus to trigger salva uh, salvation. All right, so terms. Now, this is a huge part of your exam, um, a ton of it. I took a lot of time to pick out pictures. I know it's not really my style usually, but I did this week. Um, so please make sure you aren't just listening to this, but actually taking a look at the pictures. They are going to help you significantly, so please, please, please. All right, so the first one is correlational coefficients. This is used in experiments to show the relationships between two variables being com uh, compared. The range is negative 1 to 1. Negative means there is no relationship. So it's like saying that um, there's no relationship from the more sleep you get to the amount of books you read. Like, there is no correlation there. The positive means they have a direct relationship or one causes the other. So, if it go, if it's a 0.99, that means it has a really strong positive correlation. If it's a negative 0.75, it's still a really strong negative correlation. Don't worry, I have a lot of charts coming up for correlations to help kind of visualize a little bit more. But the relationship is from negative 1 to 0 and 0 to positive 1. Now, primary and secondary reinforcers, these are used to motivate our behavior. Now, primary, as in first, is going to be ones that are dictated by evolution, so food, sex, um, money, no, food, sex, love, and water, all the things we have to have. And secondary reinforcers are money, cars, and clothing, so anything society tells us that's important to us. Now, I mentioned biological preparedness earlier. It is when an animal inherits abilities to protect itself. So one of the things that we do is um, we already instinctively have a fear of dangerous animals. So if we see a snarling dog naturally inside of us, we're like, oh, no, this isn't good. We Like even a little kid who's never seen a snarling dog knows that, oh, you probably shouldn't go over there. Um, Dangerous animals, snakes, anything that can lead to death makes us uncomfortable, including heights. That's why some of us get like physically queasy, like myself, when you're near heights, because it's dangerous. Now, the next one is binocular cues. They're cues for perceiving depth based on two eyes. 
the two cues are convergence, which are eyes tilting inward, and binocular retinal disparity. Now, retinal disparity is the difference between what your left eye sees and what your right eye sees. And convergence is when things are far, they're small. When things are up close, your eyes come in to make it look, to look in. Now the trichromatic theory is the theory of vision that proposes that three colors blend together to make up all colors. We have red, green, and blue. That your rods and your cone, that your cones, because cones see color, they can only, there are certain cones that see red, there are certain cones that see blue, there are certain cones that see green. What happens is those cones pick up those colors and then any other color in between, they kind of make that from there. So we can see that the trichromatic theory believes that you can only see in those. Now when we talk about the transduction of light, we have to talk about ganglion cells. Now ganglion cells are photoreceptor cells that are found on the retina, which is where transduction occurs in the eye. This is the only location of transduction in the eye, and they break down light to allow rods and cones to process. So light hits the retina, then it goes through your ganglion cells, then goes to your bipolar cells, and then hits your rods and cone. And the rods and cones is where we actually have the final step of transduction. Now, one of the big ways that we do research is by using case studies. Now, case studies is one one person is looked at in great detail. Uh, and case studies are not used to compare others, but to ask more specific questions. Phineas Gage is a perfect example of this. When we analyze a person's specific story, not to gain research specifically, but to gain a better understanding of simple underlining tones that we can then investigate. Because something that happens to one person isn't enough to generalize it to everyone, but it is enough to start asking more specific scientific questions in order to gather scientific evidence in order to make more generalizations to the wider public. Now when we talk about research methods, we have to talk about longitudinal. Now longitudinal research design is when one participant or groups of participants is studied for over a long period of time. So a classic example is 30 kids are studied for 30 years. Now when we talk about longitudinal, the biggest issue with longitudinal is that it takes so much time, it takes so much effort, and it takes a lot of money in order to conduct those research. Um, not a lot of people can do that. Obviously, the information that you retrieve is fantastic and so in-depth and so enriching. However, not so much so on the helpful of uh, funds. Uh, Cross-sectional is when you have five seven-year-olds, five ten-year-olds, five fifteen-year-olds, and you study at Harvard for two weeks in the summer, and then you are done. That's a cross-sectional. And then finally, you have a cross-sequential, which is when you have five seven-year-olds, five ten-year-olds, and five fifteen-year-olds. They're studied for about five years. When you do, it's a blend of cross-sequential and cross-sectional. Now, cross-sectional is obviously going to be the most popular of the three because it is more effective on money flow situation. Longitudinal is obviously the best, but cross-sequential is kind of one of that mix, so you can get a little bit of it. Now, kids always struggle with negative reinforcement. Uh, negative reinforcement is the response by which, uh, by the removal or escape from our avoidance of an unpleasant stimulus. So, for instance, in my little cartoon, it says Kayla's dab on his tummy. So, for every day that your math grade stays below a B, your father will post a video of himself on YouTube. I don't know about you, but if my dad was dancing around and posting it on like social media, that would embarrass the crap out of me. I would definitely not get a B. I'd probably get an A in the class just to avoid having that occur. And that's negative reinforcement to a T. You do something in order to avoid having to experience something else. This girl's going to get an A in math to avoid having her dad embarrass her. Now, positive reinforcement is on the opposite side. It's a response by the addition or experiencing of a pleasurable stimulus. Uh, typical reinforcements are rewards, tokens, or compliments. You do things in order to be recognized. A perfect example of this would be my uh, recognition wall, where every time you get an A, you get to go on my wall. And let's be honest, it motivates you. <laughs> you want to be on that wall. You want to tell people you're on the wall. You want to hear me call out your name so you're on that wall, all those different types of things. Now, when we talk about reinforcement, Enforcement schedules and all that stuff, you can't not talk about punishment. Now, punishment in operant conditioning is any change in an animal, a human or animal surroundings that occurs after a given behavior. So after you're supposed to do something, like for instance, you're supposed to be home at 10 o'clock and you don't follow your end, you don't come home at 10 o'clock, you come home at 10.30 
in order to get you to start following the rules, you're given a punishment. And that punishment can be you're grounded, can be you lose your cell phone, can be you stand outside your house or from Walmart and say, I'm a thief, I stole <laughs> sandwich board sign. Whatever your parents decide to do as punishment, that's it. But it is done in order to try to correct the behavior to make sure that behavior is not done again. So what it is, is when you're supposed to have done something and you didn't do it, a punishment is put in place to make sure you'll never make that option again. Now, um, start looking at brain scans. First one is EEG, and it's a brain scanning device that is used to measure brain activity. We talked a lot about EEG um, machines and all that stuff when we were doing sleep patterns and looking at our brain waves. We have the electrodes on the brain, as you can see, it makes like a cool little net, and then we get all the different images, and these are beta waves, alpha waves, all that stuff. Um, the next one is an MRI, which creates a 3D image of the brain using magnetic field. This one's going to give us the most detail. Now, a lot of people get confused between an MRI and a PET scan, a patrician, uh, positron emission thing, a PET scan. Um, PET scan is going to look at the glucose in your, you drink like this chocolatey glucose drink, and it's going to see where actual parts of your brain are functioning during that time. An MRI is just a physical structure, while a PET scan is looking at the different parts of your brain and which one is working during what times. So keep that in mind. Now, when we think about the pinna, the pinna is the outer cartilage of the ear that funnels sound into the auditory canal towards the tympanic membrane. It's the external. Uh, I have had a couple of people mention that the pinna is used for balance. It's not. Inside your ear, you have the semicircular canals, which are located just above your cochlea. That is in charge of balance in your ear. Your pinna is solely there to funnel sound into your ear, while the semicircular canals inside your ear, in your inner ear, uh, next to your cochlea, is actually doing all your balance. So no pinna, just semicircular canals. Uh, behavior modification is using operant conditioning uh, to bring about change or modification of behavior. Uh, token economy is probably the most famous. You see I have an example here. Iron stickers when I clean my room. Ask for things using nice words. Play with my dog using gentle hands. Um, and every time they, that his kid does it, he gets a sticker or she gets a sticker. And after 20 stickers, they get to play Angry Birds. So good for that kid. Another example would be a token economy. As you can see on the box, the, depending on how many tickets you get dictates what you get to do in that classroom. These are all behavior modification. People want to do these types of things. So people are willing to behave and accordingly and eventually all of these token economy and these sticker things are going to fade off and the behavior is going to stay consistent because they get that positive reinforcement for doing the right thing and that will essentially be replaced. Now, condition responses are used in classical conditioning. After the conditioned stimulus or bell triggers a response to CR, the salvation to the bell is being listed. So just like when we talked about classical conditioning and Pavlov's experiment, at first, when you ring the bell, then you follow it with food, it's eventually going to elicit a dog's uh, responsive salvation. After conditioning, the bell is going to trigger the salvation, so the bell, which was in... Uh, nothing, meant nothing to the dog, will eventually be the condition stimulus, and your condition response will be salvation. Now, keep in mind that if we continue to ring the bell and not present food with the bell, that is going to hurt conditioning, and that will stop it from being as successful, and eventually the dog will no longer respond to the bell. It will eventually start leading to uh, extinction. So we can ring the bell a couple times and get the dog to drool, but if we keep ringing the bell and there's no food is going to be presented at all, eventually that behavior is going to die out or become extinct. So keep that in mind. Um, for reliable, we use this in testing. A uh, test is reliable when a person receives a similar score every time. So no offense, despite what your math tutor wants you to believe or <laughs> even College Board, essentially your test scores on the ACT, SAT, GRE, all those things are always going to be about the same. 
you can plus or minus 100, maybe even 200 if you really bust your butt. But essentially, they're always going to be the same because they're a reliable test, which means they're a fair test, which means it's a good, solid test that's there to test your intelligence as well as what you have learned. So there's only so much you can do to improve those scores. Now, when we deal with short-term memory, it's plus or minus two in our short-term capacity, which means you can really hold up to nine items or you can hold up to five items, depending on how well your short-term memory works. Um, we use a whole encoding system in doing this. I have a little bit more. I have a picture coming up here in a little bit, but we'll talk about that. But your short-term memory is plus or minus two. It's the magic number. Now, naturalistic observation goes back to research methods. Now, this is when you go and you sit and you just watch your participants in their familiar location. Um, you're not interrupting and you're not really going out of your way to identify yourself. You're just sitting there watching, observing, and taking notes of normal interaction because we can all agree that the behavior we exist in our normal lives is not the behavior we exist in a white room with a doctor breathing down our neck. We act very proper <laughs> there, maybe not so much, you know, in our normal habitat. A perfect example is Jane Goodall. Uh, she sits in the woods, as you can see, she's my picture. She's sitting in the woods with a pad of paper watching chimpanzees play, and she takes notes. She does eventually interact because they invite her to interact, um, so it's not a perfectly clean naturalistic observation, but she is the quintessential. She was doing it for like 40 years or something. A double blind study is when, as another type of research method, it is when both researchers and participants do not know if they're getting the independent variable or the drug or if they're not. And if they're not, they're getting a placebo to continue that ruse. Um, it limits the amount of researcher bias in s studies. So if they don't know if they're getting the independent variable or the drug and they possibly are getting the placebo, anytime you mention a placebo, it's a double blind study. Um, to see, essentially. You can have a single blind study. A single blind study is when the doctor knows, but the participants don't. And a double blind is when the doctors and the participants don't know, which means it is a more true test, and there's no way of preferential treatment to those who actually are getting the uh, independent variable. Now, another type of learning that we've talked about this year is Latin learning. It's when learning is not reinforced, but is still retained. An example of this is Tolman's rats. Uh, the, the rats did learn the maze without reinforcement or food. However, they did it much faster, much, much smoother once food was introduced. So yeah, they did learn the maze and it did take some time without any type of reinforcement or support. However, once food was introduced, they got to the food very, very quickly. It does show us that essentially though, they did learn the maze without the reinforcement. Now instinctive drift is animals can be trained to do pretty much anything. Um, however, um, operant conditioning techniques, like every time a killer whale claps its fins <laughs> um, with its operant conditioning, you give it a treat. Every time it does something you like, you give it a treat. That's positive reinforcement. Um, at the end of the day, that killer whale is going to revert back to being a killer whale, hence why we know that one of the killer whales at SeaWorld killed one of its performers because in the middle of a show, it reverted back to its behavior of if something's in the water, you eat it. <laughs> so instinct of drift is that eventually any type of operant conditioning or performance is going to deteriorate back into their typical natural behaviors. So... I mean, we can teach an animal to do something like putting coins into a piggy bank. However, naturally, the raccoon kind of cleans it, drops it in, and then plays with it and stuff like that because that's what they're trained to do or it's born innate inside them. So you can try doing whatever you like to a dog, but it's still a dog. <laughs> and a raccoon is still a raccoon, and a killer whale is still a killer whale. Now, standard deviation with your percentages... Um, an average is one standard deviation above and below, and that's about 68% of the information. Your 2.1 on the right is your gifted. Your 2.1 on the left is your profoundly mentally retarded. And you have one standard deviation is 13.6. One standard deviation above, uh, two standard deviations above is 13.6. So the total comes to about 100 now, validity is when a test actually tests what it's supposed to. Um, 
if you are, te- if I'm doing a test on memory and all of a sudden I start throwing in questions about the planets, am, is my test actually testing you on memory? N- no, no, it's not. There's nothing about planets in memory. <laughs> so it's about looking at a test and making sure it actually tests what it's supposed to and not using those results in order to come up with a manipulated or a forced reading and that's why validity and also reliability which I spoke about earlier is such a big deal now restless leg syndrome is um, during sleep stage 2 a leg nerves become agitated because of pinching the vertebrae makes it very difficult to sleep I don't know what else to say but I thought my drawer, my little cartoon was super cute though I'm just going to say it um, hypnotic jerks are terrifying. Uh, that's from real life experiment, uh, real life experience here. They're during stage two sleep while experiencing sleep spindles. The body can jerk suddenly. I thought my little picture was perfect. That mini heart attack when you're in bed, almost asleep, and you suddenly get the strange uh, falling sensation. It's absolutely terrifying. Totally normal though. It's just your body trying to deal with uh, shutting, not shutting down because your brain never shuts down, but trying to power down a little bit in order to help you sleep. Now, inferential statistics are used to provide the foundation of analysis for statistical data. Uh, it makes it easier to comprehend. Uh, instead of looking at just raw data, which is unable to comprehend, just looking at it, we use mean, median, mode, and range in order to do so. Mean is obviously average. Add them all up, divide them by how many. Median is the middle number, line them all up in order and find the one in the center. Uh, mode is the most occurring. Uh, I have a little, in my little graph, it will explain how to do everything if you have more information about it. Now, how are neuron fires? You better know this. I'm just saying, we made our little neurons together. Anyway, so uh, st- neuron structure and the ordering of the firing is dendrite, soma, nucleus, axon, myelin sheath, axon terminals, terminal buttons, and synapse. Remember, your, de- your dendrites are going to receive the message. They send them to the soma or cell body. Body. Inside the soma is your nucleus, and the nucleus has two choices. Send the message, don't send the message. If it decides not to send the message, it's done. If it decides to send the message, it then sends it to the axon, which carries it from the nucleus to the terminal, axon terminal. Around the axon is the myelin sheath, and that is used to increase uh, the firing of the axon. The terminal buttons is where the actual message leaves the uh, nucleus and it actually exits through the terminal buttons. The terminal buttons open up and they let the neural impulse go into the synapse. And in the synapse, it jumps to other neurons, and that's how the message connects. Now, one of the big experiments that we've been talking about is the visual cliff. As you can see, I have a nice blow up version of what it is. Um, it demonstrates that depth perception is innate and provides us with the basic abilities to protect ourselves from birth. And this is biological preparedness. Remember, the baby is not going to crawl across, which tells us it's innate. Inside of our brain, as we transition to biology, we have corpus callosum, which is one of my favorite things. I love doing the split brain stuff, which is why I think you guys can, you know that by now. It connects the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere of the brain, allowing both sides to communicate with one another. Um, if you get rid of your corpus callosum, then that can only be done by surgery. It's called a split brain. It just allows the two parts of our brain so we are able to articulate, carry conversations, and do different types of stuff, have full access of our full bodies. Without the corpus callosum, we can't. Another part of our brain is Broca's area. It is located on the left frontal lobe. It is located on the left because the left side of our brain is language linear logic. So left side of the frontal lobe. It's known as broken jaw. It allows us to physically create language, controls tongue, jaw, and ligaments that make language production possible. So it controls all the muscles that are required to speak. So I think of all the muscles and ligaments and bones and all that stuff are moving right now just so you can, it's just so I can speak these words to you. So Broca's area is controlling that. Now, another area is our Wernicke's area, and it's located on the left temporal lobe. It's located on the temporal lobe because our temporal holds our auditory cortex, and it's also on our left because language is on the left, and we say, Wernicke, what? Language comprehension, and that's exactly what it deals with. It deals with processing all the auditory information that you're hearing. It is where language is processed and comprehended, and it's all located... Um, on your left side of the brain. Now your peripheral nervous system is 
Your nervous system is broke down into two sections. The central nervous system, which is your brain and your spine, and your peripheral nervous system. Now, your peripheral nervous system is obviously the biggest. However, it's not the most important. Now, immediately, as you can see, the peripheral nervous system breaks down to your somatic nervous system and your autonomic nervous system. Now, your autonomic or automatic is involuntary. Automatic means you don't think about it. Somatic is voluntary. So raising your hand, you know, raising the roof, you know, dancing, all those things are done by your somatic while you're breathing, your breathing, your digestion, all the things you don't necessarily think about every single day is done by your autonomic. Under the autonomic, you're going to see you have the sympathetic and your parasympathetic systems. These are done involuntary, which means you do not think about it. Now, your sympathetic nervous system is your fight or flight. This is going to give you the cardinal responses of do you respond when you're threatened, how do you react, stuff like that. Your parasympathetic is your relaxing and calming. So your sympathetic is going to be the rising of that. You know how when you get scared, you have this like feeling inside of you urging up. That's your sympathetic getting your body excited to deal with whatever it has to do, whether it's to run away or going to fight someone. And your parasympathetic is the one that cold, uh, calms you down. So the sweating, the slowing of the heart, and all that stuff. So sympathetic is your fight or flight, while parasympathetic is relaxing and calming. Please make sure you're making those connections. Now, your next is your endocrine system. It's going to be, uh, regulates your body's hormones, the gland, and charges the endocrine system is a pituitary gland, and is located near the brain stem. If you look in the center of the picture, you'll see that we have the pituitary gland is being pointed out next to the hypothalamus, and the hypothalamus essentially babysits the pituitary gland, but the two pituitary gland is actually going to be secreting all the hormones into your body. As you can see, we have a diagram of men and women, all the different parts that the pituitary pituitary gland uh, secretes hormones to in other parts of your body that secrete their own hormones and all that stuff. So these are in control of growth patterns and all that. Now, next one is narcolepsy. Narcolepsy is a sleep disorder involving uh, the brain that affects one of 2,000 Americans, and it is when your brain cannot normally regulate cycles of sleeping and waking. This can cause excessive sleepiness that results in episodes of falling asleep and slowly into REM. It sounds kind of funny. You just kind of fall asleep all the time, but um, actually it's incredibly dangerous. It infringes on life. It's, I mean, the fact you're falling down all the time, falling asleep, it's very, very dangerous. And people who have it, it's not fun, not funny or anything like that. Um, in my little cartoon, you can see the big difference. Falling asleep in front of the TV is not necklace Being someone who's working and being on TV and falling asleep, that would be a good example. Now, let's get into memories. Now, memories is something that we definitely struggle with and it's definitely something we have to we work hard for. Now, declarative memories are a type of long-term memories containing information that's consciously known, both general facts and personal information. These are things you've gone out of your way to really study and learn. Now, in order to make it a little easier, I am including a little chart that looks at human memory. So when you have human memory, you have sensory memory, short-term memory, and long-term memory. Declarative memories are going to fall under your long-term memories. Now, under long-term memories, you have explicit memories, which are your conscious, which will be your declarative, and you have your implicit or unconscious, things that you do on purpose and things that you don't do on purpose. So your declarative are your facts and events. Now, under declarative, you have your episodic and your semantic. So what are episodic? Episodics are declarative memories that contain personal information not readily available. So your first kiss, your first crush, your first movie, everything that happened to you and that only you would really know. Other explicit types of explicit memories are memories that are known, such as a fact for a test that you had to sit down and actually memorize. So the seven continents, the five oceans, the Magna Carta, signed in 1215, all these things that you had to sit down and learn. So these are explicitly learned. Now, procedural memories are non-declarative. These are things you don't think about anymore. At some point, you had to sit down and really learn it, like you have had to learn to tie your shoes. But now it's a procedural memory, which means you don't think about the process, which means they're non-declarative. Um, they're for skills, procedures, and conditional responses. They're not done consciously, like tying shoes, riding bikes, uh, writing, all these things you no longer think about. All right, I got to draw an S. So we go like this, then we go like this. All right, to draw an 
A. You go up, down, connect, make a little foot, move on. You don't think like that anymore. You just kind of do it, and that's what makes it a procedural or non-declarative memory. Now, going back to declarative memories, we have uh, semantic memories. Now, semantic memories are things that you learned, but you don't know where you picked them up. Like, everyone knows December 25th is Christmas Day. Not everyone, but most people know. Um, where did you learn it? Who taught you it? You may not know. Uh, knowing that all cats have four legs, that the ocean is big and the sky is blue, you don't know where you learned it, but you learned it. Okay? Now, here is the three stages of memory. So, encoding is where we get raw information from our sensations. They go into our sensory memory. From our sensory memory, we select certain things to pay attention. Like, for instance, in my room that I'm recording this in, the air conditioning just kicked on. So, something that was in my sensory memory of the sound of the air conditioning kicking on, because I paid attention to it, it's now my short-term memory. I'm totally going to forget this because I'm not going to do any maintenance rehearsal to remember it, but the air conditioning just kicked on. Now there's a lot of other things going on in my house right now that I'm not hearing or seeing or smelling or anything like that because I haven't given it selective attention. Once it goes into selective attention, it goes into my short-term memory. If I don't talk about the air conditioning or think about the air conditioning, it's gone within 15 to 30 seconds. But because I keep mentioning the air conditioning over and over, over and over and over again, I'm doing maintenance rehearsal. Now, with as much maintenance rehearsal, essentially I'm encoding it to go into my long-term memory. So when I think back to my midterm review video, I can say, oh my god, while I was sitting in there in my den, the air conditioning turned on, and that will be a retrieval back into my short-term or working memory. And ta-da, there is your whole cycle. There you go. Now, Continuing with a little bit of biology, we have the cerebellum, which is in the lower part of your brain. It is located behind the pons, and it controls and coordinates your involuntary or fine motor movements. The lower it is in the brain, the less uh, humanistic it is, or the less evolved it is, so it's low in the brain. This is what allows us to walk, talk, uh, uh, basic talking, and all that stuff. So, now. Um, intelligence is going to be the next thing we're going to be focusing on. Uh, intelligence or gifted intelligence is 2% of the population falling in the upper end of the normal curve and possessing an IQ of 130 or more. As you can see from my chart, um, Einstein was close to 165, um, while the average a gifted person is 130. Um, the average person ranges from an intelligence of 85 to 115. So believe me, 85, 68% uh, of the world is average. I'm okay being average. <laughs> All right, so here are the ranges for intelligence. Um, it is level, titles, and IQ ranges, below average uh, or below median. Mild mental retardation is a 55 to 70. Moderate is 40 to 55. Severe is 25 to 40. And profound um, is uh, below 25. Now, you're above average or above median. Your average, uh, above average, is going to be 100 to 115. Above average is 115 to 130, and gifted is 130 and above. Now, when we deal with perception, we are dealing with the method in which sensations are processed and interpreted, which makes things different um, into a meaningful fashion. Sensations are processed via transduction, then sent to the brain, and then processed. So as you can see in my little diagram, because the guy on the left is looking at it, it looks like a six. My guy on the right is looking at it, and it looks like a nine. Due to his location um, and how they see it is their perception. Everybody perceives things differently depending on their prior backgrounds, depending on their prior knowledge, depending on their own personal experiences. All those things are, different, are definitely going to affect. Now, the next big thing we're going to talk about is cognition. It is a process of thinking and using information to make educated thoughts or actions. When you understand how you think, you'll learn better, lead better lives. Cognition is a huge foundation of psychology. Remember, when we talk about psychology, it is about using science to understand the brain and their exploration of the science behind it. It is both philosophy as well as science. Now, we have a lot of theories, which means we can't prove there's no direct correlation. There may be causation, but not direct correlation. Um, so it is the cognition is thinking about thinking and getting it through there.
Now, your hippocampus is located in the limbic system and it houses long-term memories. If a hippo came to campus, you'd remember it. <laughs> um, experiments are next. They are a scientific procedure undertaken to make a discovery, test, or hypothesis or demonstrate a known fact. It is conducted to see the variables independent or dependent variables are affected. Independent is what is done. Uh, for instance, in class, we talked about the candy jar in the front of the room, seeing how the experiment would be, how many kids are going to steal the candy. The independent variable is the candy in the front of the room. The dependent variable is how many kids are going to steal it, the actual behavior being measured. Now, when we talk about experiments, we have a control group and we have an experimental group. The control group is there in order to have a direct uh, say on how many would or would not. An experimental group is the one being exposed to the independent variable. Now reinforcement schedules is something done by B.F. Skinner. Continuous reinforcement is the desired behavior is reinforced every single time it occurs. A perfect example of this is a vending machine. If you put in money, you get a treat. <laughs> Okay, every single time. Obviously, of course, sometimes it breaks, but that's essentially how it works. Uh, partial reinforcement is the response reinforce, uh, reinforced only part of the time. Learned behaviors are required more slowly with partial reinforcement, but the response is the most resistance to extinction. Continuous reinforcement, there's only, if I gave you a cookie every time you answered a question, there's only so many cookies you could possibly want. Like, and I love cookies, but if you were gonna give me a cookie every time I said something, intelligent I'm gonna run I'm gonna be sick of cookies like anytime I ask a question do something oh my god I'd be I'd be so full all the time so I would stop because I'm tired of eating partial reinforcement however is a lot more sustainable which is why it is less likely to meet extinction now there's a couple other ones that come up as well fixed ratio which means after a certain amount of uh, responses you get something. So an example of this is the Smoothie King punch card for four smoothies. The fifth one's free. So you have to get four and then you get the fifth one for free. Variable ratio, those are the number of responses required for reinforcement. So slot machines at Xeno, at a certain point, after so many responses, eventually is going to come out. So variable ratio is all of your slot machines. Fixed interval is gonna be your paychecks. I get paid every two weeks. So it doesn't matter if I teach like a boss every single day or I don't do anything except hopefully not get fired. Um, I get a paycheck every two weeks, two weeks nonetheless. And variable interval schedules is fishing. You, you may catch a fish. You may not catch a fish. You may catch one the moment you put your worm in the water or you may catch one six hours later. Who knows? Those are all examples of the reinforcement schedule. Obviously, the most common ones are going to be your fixed ratio schedules, as well as your variable ratio schedules. Um, variable ratio is, of course, the slot machines, and your fixed ratio are the smoothies. Now, we talked about positive and negative correlation earlier. Negative correlation is a down-facing graph. It states that there is an inverse relationship of one variable means less of another. So if you look at the chart, the more hours of TVs you have a week is the lower your grades. So the more you watch TV, the lower your grades are going to be. So the more you smoke cigarettes, the less miles you can run. Positive correlation is an upward facing graph saying that there's a dependent. When one thing happens, the other thing happens. When the student grades go up, so does the time of studying. Makes sense. There's a direct correlation happening here. So we keep saying the words direct correlation and causation. What do they mean? Correlation is the relationship between two sets of variables used to describe or predict information. There is an emphasis here on relationship. Sometimes we can use correlation to find causality, but not correlation is there is some relationship here. Causation, also known as cause and effect, is an observed an event appears to have caused a second event. So causation means one thing happens and this happens after. There is consistent, it always happens. If you eat um, a rice cake every single day, you will gain weight. There's a causation. If I say I go to Plant High School, I am on a sports team, 
there's a correlation to say I'm very good at whatever sport I'm playing because a lot of kids at plant are really good athletes. So is it always true? No. Is there a correlation? Are there probably true? Yes. Correlation means it's probably true because there's a lot that says it could happen. Causation means it definitely happens. So correlation means, eh, it's probably true. Causation means this happens, then this happens. Very factual, very straightforward. Now, psychodynamic is a psychological perspective based on Freudian principles, however, include neo-Freudian principles like psychologist Carl Jung. So, psychodynamic and psychoanalytic principles are based on Freud, okay? They're based on Freud, but psychodynamic includes other people, like all of these wonderful people in this photo, who we'll be learning a lot more about when we get to personality and all that stuff. So psychodynamic is looking at, is based on Freud, but looks at other people as well. Now, one of the big things that we were kind of talking about is selective attention when we were looking at memory. The ability to to on uh, the ability to focus on one thing at a time. No, no one can process all sensory information going on around them, so we have to choose. Like I said, while I was sitting in this room recording and obviously being fully aware of what I was saying, I heard the air conditioner kick on, and because I gave it a selective attention, it moves from my sensory memory into my short-term memory. And because I keep talking about it, or maintenance rehearsal, it's gonna stay there. All right, sensory conflict. Sensory conflict is when your body's physical sensations differ from that of visual sensation, and this creates motion sickness. If you've ever been on a boat and your body is going up and down, up and down, up and down, and but you look straight ahead and you see the horizon, which looks completely flat and stable and doesn't move, looking at that, having the experience of being up and down, up and down, up and down while looking at a straight line is very, very disruptive to your body. It doesn't understand. They, they are seeing flat. They're feeling up and down. And that uh, difference is what causes motion sickness or sensory conflict. Another major principle that we are studying and will be studying even more second semester is the humanistic psychology it focuses a lot on free will, self-image, and self-actualization. It's the belief that humans are much more advanced than their animal past. A lot like the evolutionary perspective really focuses on how close we are to animals. The humanistic is like, hey, yeah, we came from animals, but look at all these things we've done. We have free will. We have self-image. We have self-actualization. We have all these incredible things. Don't limit us to what our animal past is. And, of course, the two big guys are Carl Rogers and Abraham Manslow. Um, ecstasy. First of all, I love this photo. Like, I don't know why in, like, high school and middle school and all that stuff when they're doing, like, drug, like, dare and all that stuff, why don't they just show you before and after pictures of people on different drugs? It is horrifying. Oh, my God. So, ecstasy. If you take ecstasy, the long-term effects are brain damage, uh, the limbic system is fried, you have convulsions, depressions, kidney failure, and eventually death. In short term, you have impaired judgment, false sense of affection, depression, paranoia, blurred version. And frankly, look how handsome this man is now that he's on meth. Oh, jeez. I've seen some other ones that are worse. However, I didn't want to scare you. I mean, this is kind of terrifying, but, like, there were some really, like, messed up ones. So I picked the middle of the road. You're welcome. Learn helplessness. Uh, we use the Silgram experiment. Um, it's likely to occur when a subject faces only negative reinforcement all the time. So without giving people a positive reinforcement and just being negative, 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 they feel like they can't do anything, so why try? Um, we see this a lot with kids. If you aren't, when you have kids in the far, 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 far future, it's about raising them, being forceful, and making sure they're doing the right thing, but also giving them positive and both negative reinforcement. It's about using, developing as a full person, not a half. Like, for instance, our little pink little elephant over here, he can totally move that peg. <laughs> but it's the feeling of being trapped. And then the feeling of no matter what he does, it doesn't matter. He'll never escape. It makes him feel like, why even bother? Isn't that so sad? Um, convergent thinking is a type of thinking in which a problem is seen as having only one answer for all the lines of thinking, and that all will eventually lead to a single answer using prior knowledge. So, math. There's one solution. So conversion things differently for a final solution, omitting other possibilities. There's only one solution no matter what. 
divergent thinkers, thinks of all the possible ways to reach a final solution. There's so many different ways, like a big, big, big idea person, while convergent thinkers, okay, all this big stuff won't work, here's the one answer, Why well, divergent is like, here's the problem, here's a million solutions. A convergent thinker is, here's a million problems, here's our solution. It's about reversal of thought. Creativity is the process of solving problems by combining ideas and behaviors in new ways. So looking at something differently, like for instance, um, Andy Warhol painted a tom Campbell's tomato soup. I mean, you've seen the picture or an image similar to it. And it's he challenged the idea of what is art. He took something that everyone's seen, everyone owns, and put it on a wall, and now it's worth like $50 million or something. It's because he took something that we don't see as art and made us look at it as art. That's creativity. It's taking things, combining things in new ways. Inductive reasoning is when you take all the information available and use it to create a new foundation. Inductive reasoning makes broad generalizations from specific observations. So inductive reasoning is based on observation, you observe a bunch of stuff, you find a pattern, you come up with a hypothesis, and then you create a theory. So you go from the top down, from the bottom up. You get the observations instead of saying, hey, here's my theory, let's prove it. It's going the other way. Now, to solve principles, please make sure you take a look at this and make sure you know your different to solve principles. Um, it's a big deal, and we kind of talk about it. It's not one of my best teaching strengths, so make sure you take definitely take a peek at it today. Um, I have a lot of really good images here so please 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 um what is just all principles it's an early perspective in psychology focusing on the perception of sensation particularly the perception of patterns and whole figures the whole is greater than the sum of its parts so there are eight major aspects of just all principles the first one is proximity because we see all these dots in rows of four and three columns we see them as together it's one unit no, they're actually not. They're all separate little balls, but since they're all placed near each other, we assume they're together. Similarity is that we see that some of these dots are darker, while some of these are lighter. We see that they are similar. The dark ones are similar and all that stuff. Enclosure is that we have now put, because there's two rectangles, we've now put all of those center ones into a container. Symmetry is that we like seeing things in patterns. Uh, closure is my favorite, is when our brain, like, that's just, it's not a full circle, but our brain fills it in because it's easier for our brain to process. That's not a full square. Um, when we fill in the information in order to complete the image, it's called closure. Continuity is we like to see the finished product, connection, and figure ground is another big one. Closure and figure ground are the two biggest just all principles. The figure is the dark the ground is the background, the figure is the vase, you can see a nice beautiful vase, and the ground is two faces looking at each other with the black in the middle. So closure and figure ground are the two big ones. Now classical conditioning is when we're dealing with unconditioned stimulus, which is a naturally occurring stimulus that leads to an involuntary reflex. Um, so the unconditioned stimulus is the food. The unconditioned response is the drooling to the food or an involuntary response to a naturally occurring or unconditioned response. Now, once we, rent, once we show the food, we get a drool, fantastic. Then we introduce the bell. Before conditioning, it's a neutral stimulus, which means it has no effect on the or desired response. Eventually, as conditioning uh, finishes, the conditioned stimulus, or the stimulus of being able to produce a learned reflex responsible for being paired with the original conditioned stimulus, what that means is we ring the bell during conditioning, ring the bell, give them the food, ring the bell, give them the food, ring the bell, give them the food, ring the bell, give them the food. Eventually, the dog is going to tie the bell to the food. So eventually, the dog is going to start drooling when he hears the bell and when he sees the food. So the condition response is the learned reflex response to a condition stimulus. So eventually the dog is going to start drooling to the bell and not the food. Keep in mind, if we ring the bell a bunch of times and the dog never gets the food, eventually will not respond to the bell. Eventually that will eventually die out because it's not being supported. Operant conditioning is the uh, is another type of learning, and it is by B.F. Skinner, and it's when motivations, both positive and negative, can directly control our behaviors and responses. So, operant conditioning, you have reinforcement, both positive and negative. When you deal with negative, it's escape or the removal or something, or an active avoidance. 
Okay, avoid something nauseous or something bad. Or studying to avoid getting a bad grade would be active avoidance. Escape would be turning off alarm clock um, in order to stop hearing the noise. Punishment is uh, to decrease a behavior while reinforcement is to increase a behavior. I really like that. I think it makes it much more simple. Uh, positive punishment is add something to a behavior like spanking a child for cursing or my mom's favorite putting soap in your mouth um, negative is to remove something so um, taking away a cell phone for a week would be a negative punishment so next is the vestibular sense it's a sensation of movement balance and body position uh, they have a strong understanding of where their body is in space. Dancers are mostly known for this. They have strong muscle movement, posture, strain on muscle joints, equilibrium, body position, and space. I have none of this. I can't. I, I walk into tables. I definitely can't do that move. Whatever he's doing, that's just not possible. There's no arm strength or any strength for that. Uh, cognitive perspective is an early perspective that focuses on intellectual abilities and the human's ability to choose and define itself. They focus on thinking, perception, and information processing. So anytime you think of thinking, perception, and information processing, it has to be cognition. Thinking about thinking, and that's exactly what they do, and your big guy is Howard Gardner. So thinking, perception, and information processing, which is really thinking about thinking, cognitive. Uh, your parietal lobe is located behind the frontal lobe, and it holds the body's somatosensory cortex, processes afferent neurons, and it's since it's sensation information and this is where all sensations are being processed so information goes um, from your peripheral nervous system to your parietal lobe and gets processed in your somatosensory cortex with your afferent neurons a before e and then your efferent neurons which are created in your frontal lobe or in your motor motor cortex are going to be sent down through your peripheral nervous system to respond Next is your limbic system. It's a group of several brain structures under the cortex and involved in learning, emotion, memories, and motivation made up of the hippocampus, thalamus, hypothalamus, and amygdala. Keep in mind your amygdala is going to be dealing with all of your fears. Um, your thalamus, your hippocampus is going to be dealing with your long-term emotions. So your amygdala is your, um, is your fear, not fear, um, Oh my god. <laughs> um, while your hippocampus is your memory. Uh, yes. Confirmation bias is when people see only what they want to see in a situation, then they use it to prove or disprove their own beliefs. Uh, example, a uh, classic example is a teacher thinks boys are bad and only watches boys during rec uh, recess and not the girls and confirms beliefs because he sees, uh, she sees, or he sees boys being aggressive and doing all that. Well, because she's in, he or she is not watching the girls, the girls are being just as aggressive, just different and not being watched, so they confirm their own thoughts. My favorite is, you know, I've heard rhetoric from both sides. Time to do my own research for the real truth. Click on the first link that agrees with you, and ta-da. I mean, you can find anything you want on the internet. The craziest, most horrific thoughts you have, someone out there has already thought it. Confirmation bias. Jeez. Hindsight bias is known as the new-it-all long effect or creeping determinism. It is an inclination after an event has occurred to see... Um, what events have been that the event having been predictable, despite there has been little to no objective base, uh, basis for predicting it. Um, like, for instance, I knew all along the Patriots were going to make it into the 2016 playoffs. I just knew it. I mean, they're the New England Patriots, um, you know, so obviously. Even though no one anticipated that, <laughs> no one knows. Um, but I say, oh, well, I knew it the whole time. It's not going to happen. When I found this meme, I literally laughed, so I had to include it. Not sure Taylor Swift knew you were trouble or hindsight bias. I knew you were trouble when... <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. Anyway. Next one is misinformation effect. It happens when a person's recall of an episodic memory becomes less accurate because of post-event information. Um, to how to kill... Making a murderer, exactly, um... 
people released information about a horrific crime and that horrific crime never occurred and tainted the jury. That's what the movie documentary is trying to prove. Do not argue with me. I'm not here to argue it. But because of information released about the crime, even when they heard um, the truth and the testimonies, it didn't matter. They already thought it was already a horrific crime. And that's the most uh, misinformation effect. Kinesthetic is a sense of body, uh, sense of location of body parts in relation to the ground of each other. Hand-eye coordination is this. Um, it's different from vestibular. Vestibular is how you move in the world. Kinesthetic is how your body moves within itself. How quickly you can send neural messages back and forth. I have kinesthetic sense. I have a very strong, I really do have good hand-eye coordination. Um, I cannot walk into a classroom without nailing my foot or my hip on a desk, but I can catch things, so good for me. Debriefing is required under the ethical regulations of all psychological experiments. During the post-experiment, every single participant must be given the opportunity to hear and ask questions about the experiment and its results. Unlike my cartoon, it's not about taking off your underwear. It's about understanding what you just experienced, what came out of it, um, what are the future steps, uh, being able to read the documents if you so choose. It's a big part of making sure that um, your participants are educated about what is happening and we're just not doing things and just letting them wander away. Another major term is placebo effect. It is when a participant believes the placebo is an independent variable and sees changes in behavior or physical changes. Um, it's all completely in their head. When a person is in a diet program and they receive a placebo rather than a, the independent variable or the drug, what happens is, is they lose crazy amounts of weight. They're like, oh my god, this pill works. No, no it didn't. You actually did that all by yourself. And that's placebo effect. So my little joke down here is, our trials show that the new drug performs no better than the placebo. <laughs> and then when the guy says, maybe we should invest in placebos. So, ta-da. Uh, maintenance rehearsal, as I've kind of covered a couple times and just talking about other information, is when you're dealing with memories, the more you use the information in a memory, the more likely it is to be coded correctly and recalled. Uh, the example I've been using this evening is um, the air conditioning that it kicks on all the time in my sensory memory and you always hear it in the background but you pay no attention to it, but I did. And so it has moved into my short-term memory. And because I keep talking about this damn air conditioning kicking on, it is now being um, encoded. Or because of my maintenance rehearsal, it's being encoded, which forever and always I'm going to remember that the air conditioning kicked on while I was making this video. How exciting. So when you see rehearsal, it's the same thing as maintenance rehearsal. A collaborative rehearsal is when uh, working in memories, a person adds more information to make uh, the content easier to remember. An example of that is PEMDAS. Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally to help order, remember the order of operations. Um, sometimes you'll hear someone say something and you'll just kind of recall. That's the, it helps you recall. Context is a circumstance that form the setting for an event, statement, or idea and the terms in which can be fully understood. So it's saying that... Um, when someone says, oh my god, I just watched this movie, and you say, what's that movie? And you're like, oh, I've never seen it. And they're like, no, 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 it's like this, 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 and they tell you a bunch of background information, you're like, oh my god, I've totally seen that movie, it's such a good movie. So just having back more information or background information helps you to recall information faster. We use this in memory when you're thinking, like, when you're sitting at one of your midterms, and you're sitting there like, oh my god, I know this. Think about where you sit in my classroom normally, where I'm usually standing, and you like think about what you can. Oh my god, she used an example with a dog or a bear. I use a lot of bear examples, so use that one. And you sit there and you think, and maybe it'll come to you because you're giving yourself a vague kind of context or vague type of area in which the information probably existed. Next one is observational learning. Bandora founded that we as humans mimic what we see in his famous Boba doll experiment. I thought this was cute. <laughs> Gardner, um, theory of multiple intelligences, he started with nine, ends with 11, all you need to know is nine. Verbal linguistic is writing stories, scripts, uh, poems, storytelling, math or logical is counting, calculating, theorizing, uh, theorizing, musical, performing, singing, playing, composing. 
visual spatial is drawing, painting, illustrating, graphic design, collage making. Bali kinesthetic is dance recital, athletic performance, competition, interpersonal, plays, debates, panels, group work, when you work together. Intra is journals, memoirs, diaries, changing behaviors, habits, personal growth. Naturalist, collecting, classifying, caring for animals. At nature centers, all those different types of things. And existential is like community service, big picture, and trying to make the world a better place. All right. Uh, next one is independent versus dependent variable. Independent variable is the cause, what you're studying. So I want to see if caffeine improves test scores. So the independent variable is caffeine. Okay. Um, the variable is what I, as the experimenter, control. So in my famous experiment of putting candy by the door, the candy is the independent variable. Now, the dependent variable is the effect, or the results of the experiment. This is the variable that is being measured by. So if I put the candy by the door, which is the independent variable, the dependent variable is whether you steal the candy or you don't steal the candy. And the coffee experiment is, does coffee help or not help on tests? So independent variable is the coffee, the dependent variable is how well you do on the test. I would not do that on a midterm. I would do it on a simple weekly test. <laughs> Algorithms are very specific step-by-step -step procedure of solving certain types of problems. Y equals mx plus b, which is your slope. Um, it's literally a formula. If there's a formula, it's an algorithm. Functional fixedness is when you look at an item and you see it for its intended purpose, not for its creative uses. Um, for instance, if you look at my little cartoon, this person has to hold on to two ropes. She can't do it without assistance. Um, however, she does not suffer from functional fixedness because she takes the wrench or whatever that is, I have no idea, a clamp thing, I don't know, and uses it to swing the other rope in order to get it to her hand. So she does not suffer from functional fixedness. But if you just stood there and said, oh my god, I can't get the rope, you would suffer from functional fixedness. There you go. Now when we talk about left brain, right brain, left is linear language logic. Linear language logic. Right is everything else. Okay, so when you think of left, think of analytic, logic, language, science, and math is all left-brained. Right-brained is your creativity, your art, your intuition, your holistic thoughts, your interpersonal, all those different types of things. And your forgetting curve. Now, Bangus, we forget a lot of information really quickly, as you've seen. However, we do, do hold on to some information for a long time. All right, guys, that is it for me. Oh, my goodness, I went through this as fast as I possibly can. I hope this helps. Please make sure you're looking at my charts. Don't just listen to it. I know um, watching it is not always the most exciting, but you're going to crush your exam. I'm so proud of you. Thank you so much, so much for working hard for me. If you need anything, please let me know. I know you're going to do great on my exam, and I also know you're going to do great on yours, your other ones. Anyway, um, good luck, my darlings, and I can't wait to start new content. Good luck.